Number eight, Christianity in East Asia. And for our teaching tonight, Matt Elton is going to share with us. He has extensive experience with Asian languages, I know. He has uh, studied Japanese and Chinese extensively. And this subject is something that he has written about and uh, that he has he has spoken to me about in the past and that is dear to his heart. And so I thought he would be uh, the best one qualified to talk on this subject tonight. So Matt, why don't you come up and share with us about Christianity in East Asia. Thanks, Sean. It's an honor to talk about uh, Christianity in East Asia. And I'd like to thank Sean for inviting me. Um, I think this is a really important topic because for the reason that it's so often left out and ignored in Christian history. When you pick up a book in Christian history, it often focuses on uh, Christianity in the West and makes the assumption that Christianity is a Western religion. And uh, a lot of Christian history often focuses on the Catholic Church as if it were the only church. Maybe they'll talk a little bit about Eastern Orthodox, but rarely do you hear much about history further East than that. Uh, and the reality is that as Christianity spread west into Rome and eventually into England and France, uh, it was also spreading east at the same time, and it was also spreading south into Africa. And uh, it was really a global religion from the, from the beginning. So it's important to have a perspective on Christianity outside of Europe so we get a perspective on how it was and continues to be a global religion. Um, so in this lecture, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to focus on the past 500 years because this is the 500 class, but I do want to lay some foundation on early Christianity in, uh, in, in East Asia. And, and Christianity in Asia is such a, such a broad topic. Um, I'm, I'm going to narrow it down and really focus on China and Japan as the two main areas. Um, although there is much more to the history in India, in Mongolia, in the Middle East that I'm not going to have time to, to cover tonight. Uh, but I, I, we're going to focus on the early Asian Christianity, then we're going to look at Japan, and then we're going to look at China. And this is going to provide a broad overview, um, by no means a detailed or in-depth study, but it will provide a broad overview of the history. Christianity uh, first entered Asia in the first century. And a lot of people will be surprised to know that some of the oldest churches in the world that are still standing today are actually in India. Um, and these are known as the St. Thomas churches, and they're, some of them, they date back very early, some of them to the first century. And St. Thomas is believed to have, or the Apostle Thomas, is believed to have brought Christianity to India in the first century. Um, in the, here's a statue of the Apostle Thomas uh, at one of these churches. So Christianity has a long history in India as well as the Middle East. Um, and the way that it entered into, uh, into China uh, was through a church known as the, the Nestorian Church, or the Church of the East. And this church resulted uh, around 431 AD as a result of something called the Nestorian Schism. And Nestorius was, a, uh, was the bishop of Constantinople, present-day Istanbul, Turkey. And <clears throat> he was involved in a major disagreement and a major controversy over the nature of Christ. And uh, there was two, two views that were, that were condemned as heresy. One of them is known as mon monophysitism, which says that uh, Jesus was neither human nor divine, because in him the human and the divine merged and formed something new. And that was con uh, condemned as a heresy, because it, the Bible clearly teaches that he was human. Uh, Diophysitism, which is kind of the opposite view, is what is associated with, with Nestorius, and that is the separation of the human and the divine within Christ. Uh, but this was also condemned as a heresy, and the, the, Ch the Chalcedonian definition, which was established at the Chalcedonian Creed, is that Christ is 100% human and 100% God, yet there's only one nature. And how this works is a mystery. I, I was trying to find a diagram to describe it, but it really defies any kind of diagram, because it's not logic. It, it defies our human logic. Uh, but that, this is known as the hypostatic union. And that became the, at least in the West, that became the Orthodox teaching after the Chalcedonian Creed. Nestorius disagreed with this, this definition of Christ. And he also disagreed with another issue, which is, what do we call Mary? Is she Theotokos, which means the God-bearer, or Christotokos, the Christ-bearer? And Nestorius believed that she should be called Christ-bearer, because there's no way that she could be the mother of God. God has always existed. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, but 
uh, Theotokos, that she is the God-bearer of the Mother of God, became the official Catholic doctrine, and Nestorius was excommunicated, and, uh, and he was exiled to Egypt, along with 17 other bishops who agreed with his teaching. And Nestorius himself uh, actually was more of a conservative, he, and, and he was really exiled mostly for political reasons, but his teachings became, uh, or at least the teachings associated with him, became the standard teaching of the Church of the East. So while we have the, the Chalcedonian Creed and the Trinity, as, as interpreted by the Chalcedonian Creed, established in the West, there's this whole other church in the East that completely disagrees with it, and it continues to exist and even spreads and flourishes. And this map shows the Church of the East at the height of its power in around uh, 1000 AD. And as you can see, it's a, it covers a huge area from Israel all the way to China. And uh, at the height of its power, this was the largest church in the world, and, and some scholars believe probably the most populous, uh, really dwarfing the, the Catholic Church in Europe in size. Um, so it's really surprising that this history is, is so often left out or ignored. A lot of textbooks will just touch briefly on the Nestorian Church and, and just basically say that they were heretics and, and not and go into any more depth, but the reality is at this time, this church was actually larger than the Catholic Church, and they believed that they had the Orthodox doctrine and the Catholics uh, did not. Uh, the Nestorian Church of the Church of the East was the first to bring Christianity into, into China, and that happened in 635 A.D. Uh, Luoben uh, is a, it was a Persian Christian who led the mission, that's, that's his Chinese name at least, and uh, he brought Christianity into China in 635, and this church building that you see here is the oldest church in China that's still standing, and it, it was built in 640. And this was recently, uh, it's no longer in use, but it's being renovated and it will eventually become a museum. It's been declared a protected uh, building by the Chinese government. Um, and inside of this building, there are, there are paintings that depict different scenes in the Bible. This one depicts um, the triumphal entry with the palm branches. And <clears throat> uh, so they've, been, they've identified this as being a Christian church. And uh, Christianity entered China in a really good time. There was the Tang Dynasty, which was a uh, golden age in Chinese history, and it was a time of great religious freedom. And Emperor Ta Tang Taizong uh, liked Christianity. He called it Jingjiao, which means the light or the luminous religion or, or the religion of light, and he commanded that it be spread throughout China. So Christianity had a, a very good reception in China when it first entered. And this monument that was erected in 781 AD in the city of Xi'an uh, commemorates the first 150 years of Christianity in China. And it's engraved with 1,900 Chinese characters that tell in great detail the history of early Christianity in China. They've also discovered uh, recently um, Christian writings in Chinese in a cave near Dunhuang, China, that are known as the Jesus Sutras. And these, some of them are translations of biblical texts. Some of them are just writings on uh, Christianity or, or Nestorian theology. And these also date back to the 7th century uh, or, and the 8th century and uh, re record some of the history. And this monument is still on display in Xi'an at a museum. Um, before, next, I want to kind of shift gears a little bit and, and, and go forward in time to uh, the Catholic missions in, in East Asia. But first, I just want to say that the, although Christianity uh, entered China and had a good reception, later dynasties persecuted Christianity, so Christianity diminished. But when Marco Polo showed up in 1271, he, he found Christians already in China and was surprised by that. Uh, so Christianity remained a minority religion from the 7th century to, uh, onward. So Marco Polo showed up in, in China in 1271. He was the first modern European to go, to go to China, and he brought back a lot of information about it. It wasn't long afterward before the Catholic Church started sending missionaries over. The first missionaries went in, in the 1290s. Um, but the, the real, uh, the, they really stepped up the missionary work in the 1500s, especially the Jesuit order or the Society of Jesus. And there's two uh, great Jesuit mission, missionaries who I, I want to focus on, one of them being Francis Xavier, the other being Matteo Ricci. Um, so first we'll look at Francis Xavier and what he did uh, for this mission to Japan, and then we'll look at the, the history in China. Francis Xavier was a Jesuit missionary from Portugal, um, a Catholic part of the Jesuit order. And he was a, mission in, uh, a missionary in many parts of the world. First he went to Africa, 
and uh, he won many converts there, and then he went to India, winning many converts. Uh, then he went to Indonesia. And this whole time he was, uh, at least when he was in Indonesia, he was really trying to find a way to get to Japan. Uh, at this time, very little was known about Japan. Only two Europeans had ever been there. And uh, it was literally the, the end of the world. It was the most distant land. Um, and Japan was, was, for most of its history, a very isolationist society. Foreigners were not welcome. So it was very difficult just to, just to get to Japan. He, he was not able to find a ship willing to take him there. Uh, and then he, he in a, an incredible coincidence happens. He runs into a uh, samurai who's been exiled from Japan. His name is Anjiro. And amazingly, he speaks Portuguese. And this is <laughs> really surprising because only two Europeans had ever been to Japan. And now he finds this Japanese who speaks Portuguese. He had been in contact with one of the two Europeans uh, for, who had been to Japan. And he ended up in Indonesia because he had been exiled for committing murder. And one of the penalties was you'd be exiled out of the country. And so he, he finds Francis Xavier in Indonesia, and he becomes a Christian after Francis Xavier uh, preaches the gospel to him. And he agrees to go back to Japan with Francis Xavier and act as his interpreter. And this is, he, he's literally risking his life to do this because he's been exiled from the country. Now he's coming back. But they, uh, Francis Xavier and some other missionaries and uh, Anjiro hitch a ride aboard a pirate ship. Uh, it was the only ship they could find that would take them to Japan. And they, they arrive in Japan in 1549. And uh, he's the first missionary to go to Japan. Uh, this monument uh, in Nagasaki, Japan, commemorates uh, Francis Xavier's arrival. Uh, it, it depicts Francis Xavier and Jiro and, and Bernardo, who was another missionary. And there were, there were many uh, Portuguese missionaries who went to Japan shortly afterwards. Uh, but Francis Xavier was really the one paving the way and pioneering this whole movement. Um, Francis Xavier hoped to see the emperor, but he was not able to. Uh, the, the emperor really didn't have any interest in foreigners. Uh, he had, Francis Xavier, he, they were taken in, and, and Jiro, they were taken in by some Japanese, lived at their home, uh, and they, they basically laid low. They, uh, they were not able to get an audience with any of the leaders of Japan. And uh, Xavier did not win many converts during his mission. He really struggled to understand the culture. He really struggled to understand the language. He realized that to, to preach the gospel effectively, he had to really learn the language instead of relying on an interpreter. And he, he struggled. He, he was a very well-educated man. He, he, had, he had understanding of Indian and African languages. Um, but Japanese was completely different than any language he had ever learned before. And uh, nothing was known about it. At this point in time, in the 1500s, Europeans had been in China for over 200 years. They had studied Chinese, and uh, they had written books about it. Uh, but Japanese was completely different. Nobody had ever learned Japanese before. Uh, imagine being in a foreign land. You're trying to preach the gospel. You don't know the language. Nobody has ever learned the language, so you can't ask someone to teach you. Um, so this is an incredible uh, thing that he did. And although he, he was in Japan for three years, only won a small number of converts before he left, uh, eventually went to China to continue to preach until his death. Uh, and he probably left Japan feeling uh, as if his mission was not very successful. But I think this is a great example of where the labor that we do for the Lord, sometimes we don't always see the full fruit of it in our lifetime. Uh, the reality is he planted a seed and he laid the foundation, and then other missionaries came and they watered that seed. And for the next 50 years, Christianity grew in Japan, especially in Nagasaki. And then there was an event in 1597 uh, that began the persecution. This is a major turning point. Um, in 1600, and really began in the late 1500s, ultimately in 1600, there was the rise of the Tokugawa shogunate. And what happened was the, the, the authority of the emperor was greatly diminished. Although the emperor remained on the throne, real political power was in the hands of the shoguns, or warlords, who ruled different parts of Japan. And these warlords were ruthless, and they hated anything foreign. And they viewed Christianity as a foreign religion, um, they were isolationists in their mentality. They, they viewed Japanese culture as being superior. They didn't want any foreign cultures entering Japan because they thought they would just infect and contaminate Japan. Uh, so they, they vehemently persecuted Christians beginning on February 5, 1597 with an, an event known as the martyrdom of the, of the 26 martyrs. And on that date, there were, there were 26 Christians, four Spanish, one Mexican, one Indian, and 20 Japanese. Um, so some missionaries, including some from Mexico and India, uh, 
was kind of surprising that they would end up in Japan. And, and 20 native Japanese were all put to death for their faith uh, by crucifixion. They lined them up on the, on, on the shore of the beach and crucified them. And what these shoguns would do is they would take an image of Christ, whether it be a painting or a, 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 a statue of Christ on the cross, they would lay it on the floor and force Christians to step on it. And some gave in thinking, this is just an outward action. God knows that in my heart I'm really a Christian. But many did not give in, and they said, you know, I'm not going to do anything that is going to uh, disrespect my Lord. And those who refused to give in would be crucified. Uh, this was not the only mass crucifixion. It's important because it was the first one, but some that came later were even worse. Um, in 1632, 55 Christians were, per, were, uh, were crucified at one time. And the, the persecution continued for... Uh, almost 300 years, and Christianity was driven underground in, in Japan. And those Christians are, are known as the Kakure Christians, or the, the hidden or secret Christians, because they had to operate secretly uh, in, in uh, underground churches. And this is a monument in Nagasaki commemorating the 26 martyrs. And you'll notice some of them are shorter than the others, because there were also children who were crucified, along with adults. And then in 1868, there's a, there's a major turning point in Japanese history called the Meiji Restoration. What happens is that Emperor Meiji comes to power, and he is a, a brilliant emperor, a brilliant political leader who really wants to modernize Japan. He looks honestly at the outside world, and he sees that the West has gotten far more advanced technologically and socially, and he realizes that Japan has fallen behind. So what he does is he brings in modern technology from the West. He, he, he learns from all the academic sources from the West. He modernizes the government. He establishes a democratically elected parliament. He writes a constitution. And one of his reforms that he does in 1895 is he allows religious freedom. So in 1895, Christians are able to come out of the shadows. And there were counted uh, 100,000 Christians in Nagasaki. This is after 300 years of persecution. If, it, if there's that many Christians still there after almost 300 years of persecution, imagine how many there could have been before the persecution. It really shows, even though it's, from the Shogun's perspective, they had completely wiped out, they thought they had completely wiped out Christianity. The reality was it was really growing behind the scenes. And then what happens, of course, is World War II. This is a, a terrible time for Christians in Japan, for everyone. Um, during this time, a lot of the great reforms Emperor Meiji had done to make Japan a world power are undone. There's tyranny instead of democracy. Uh, Shinto is established as a state religion. Um, people are forced to worship the emperor. But Christians hold fast to their faith. And uh, unfortunately, Nagasaki, being one of the cities where Christianity was most rooted in Japan, is also one of the cities chosen for the atomic bombing. And, uh, on August 9, 1945, the U.S. drops an atomic bomb in the Urakami district of Nagasaki, which was the most Christian district, almost 100% Christian. And it lands just 500 meters from the Urakami Cathedral, uh, killing 70,000 people. And this was a major blow to uh, Christianity in Japan. Really terrible history. Uh, moving forward to today, uh, J Japan has total religious freedom. It's a modern democratic country, but only about 1% of Japanese are Christian. Uh, most are atheist or agnostic. Um, and the reality is there's very few missionaries in Japan. When we think about missions, we often think about Africa, different third world countries. We don't often think about a really prosperous modern country like Japan, but the reality is there's a, there's a great need for evangelism there. Uh, many Japanese have never really heard the gospel. And Many of the missionaries that are there are not being very effective because they, there's cultural and language barriers. So we really need a modern-day Francis Xavier who's going to rise up and take Christianity to Japan and, and learn the language and, uh, and be that missionary for Japan because there, there's a great uh, need and there's also a great opportunity because there is religious freedom and there is the freedom to preach. Uh, this is really a mission field that deserves more attention. So next I want to shift gears and, and look at China, beginning with the, the early Jesuit missions from 1500 to present. And the, the, the first missionary that I want to look at is Matteo Ricci. He was, um, like Francis Xavier, he was a, a Jesuit missionary in the 1500s. Uh, 
Um, and he was an Italian. And uh, there, at, at this time, there were many Jesuit mission, missionaries in, in China. This, um, Marco Polo had, just, had uh, been the first European to go to China in 1271. And in the 13th, 14th, 1500s, there was more and more contact between China and the West. And the, the Jesuit missionaries really helped there to be a healthy relationship between the East and the West. They were liked by the emperor. They worked in the emperor's court. And they translated many important documents. They translated many great writings from the West into Chinese. And they translated many Chinese writings into Latin. Um, and there was this really healthy dialogue that went back and forth. But a lot of these missionaries were not very effective at preaching the gospel. Um, and, and Ricci is an exception. He, he was extremely effective because um, he he understood Chinese culture, and he uh, appealed to the Chinese because he, he wore Chinese dress. In fact, he wore the same robes a Buddhist monk would wear. So when people saw him, they thought, this must be a religious person. Um, he wore his hair in a long pigtail known as a queue, which is traditional Chinese style at the time. And he spoke Chinese fluently, uh, and he had great respect for the Chinese. So he was able to preach the gospel in a way that they understood. Um, but many thought that he went too far, because there was this controversy known as the Reich controversy. And um, what Ricci did is he tried to adapt the mass and, and some of these Catholic rituals into a more Chinese style so that it would be uh, relevant for people. And this caused a lot of controversy in the Catholic Church, especially with the practice of the rites, the Confucian rites, which are also known as ancestor worship. Uh, but, but Matteo Ricci didn't see it as worship. He saw this, th this is a practice of burning incense in remembrance of an ancestor. It goes back a long time in Chinese culture for hundreds of years. Matteo Ricci saw this as basically a cultural tradition. It's not really worship. It's a, it's a, it's a respect. It's a form of remembrance and respect. But others in the Catholic Church said, this is idolatry. We, need, we can't allow this. Um, so there's a great debate over this. It actually continued for a few hundred years. Um, and ultimately, <laughs> what happened is that the Pope ultimately made a ruling that the rites are idolatry and we can't allow them. And he forbid further discussion on the topic. And uh, not too long after that, he, that, was, uh, that ruling was made in the 1700s. So Matteo Ricci was already dead at this point. But the controversy was still continuing. And the pope finally made this ruling. Um, and then not, not long after that, in the early 1800s, the Jesuit missions were ended. Uh, and that was the end of an era. Uh, and, and some of the healthy relationship uh, and mutually respectful relationship between the East and the West that the Jesuits helped to bring out was rapidly uh, undone, and there was a great uh, deterioration of relations, of relations in the 1800s, which we'll look at in a second. But first, I want to uh, bring to light a major twist in the story that was very unexpected that happened in the 1800s, and that was the uh, rising of a false prophet in 1837. Uh, Hong Xiuquan had a very strange uh, had a very strange dream or vision. He was a Chinese guy, um, and he had this crazy vision. It's very complex. I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but one of the key things is he had, there was this dark figure robed in black who get, had a, a long gold beard, and he gave him a sword and said, with this sword, exterminate all demons from China. So Hong wakes up from this dream, and he, he doesn't know what to make of it. Um, and, and for several years, he does nothing. Nothing happens. But then he, received, then he meets a Protestant missionary. This is the 1800s. Protestants are starting to come in. The Jesuits have left. And uh, the, mission, the missionary gives him a, a gospel tract, which he reads. And unfortunately, he completely misunderstands the gospel. <laughs> and he comes to believe that he is the son of God, and that he's, he's the younger brother of Jesus, and that God is basically called him to be the Jesus for Chinese, or the, the, the Chinese Messiah. And, um, this is really exactly what Christ said would happen, that in the last days there would be many false prophets, there would be many coming saying, I am he. Uh, and this is exactly what happened. And, and the, the devastation that this caused is astronomical. Uh, because what Hong Siu does, he, he gathers a massive following of people, and he establishes this new religious movement called the Tai Pings, which means the Great Peace. And he establishes, he, he then declares independence from uh, the Kingdom of China, and he establishes his own nation, which he calls Taiping Tianguo, or the, the, great, the, the heavenly kingdom of great peace. And that then, there's great irony in this name, because it, there was no peace at all. What ends up happening is this sparked a massive civil war that continued from 1850 until 1864, 20, uh, a 14-year war 
uh, that completely devastated China. This map here shows some of the territory that he seized, uh, that, he, uh, that he seized and declared independent from China. And there was a great war to retake this territory. Uh, and, and what's interesting is that this civil war in China happened at the same time as the American Civil War. Uh, but it was far more uh, devastating. The American Civil War killed about half a million people. This Civil War was one of the bloodiest wars in history. 20 million people killed. And it's amazing that uh, a lot of people in the West don't know much about this history. It was actually one of the mo most, literally one of the bloodiest wars in, hi in the history of the world, not just in China. Um, and it all started with this false prophet who claimed to be, to, who claimed to be the son of God. So the, the, the ramification of this is that it severely damages Christianity's reputation in China. When people think about Christianity, they, they, they remember the Taiping Rebellion, <laughs> which of course had nothing to do with, Christianity, with true Christianity. Uh, but the, the reputation was severely damaged. And what's amazing is that a lot of the great Protestant missionaries were coming into China at the exact same time that this war was happening. Uh, the next missionary I want to look at is Hudson Taylor. This here is a, a painting of one of the battles of the Taiping Rebellion. And <clears throat> Hudson Taylor uh, arrived in, in Shanghai in, in China in 1853. And he was a Protestant missionary um, and he arrived in the middle of the Taiping Rebellion. In fact, the day he arrived, the city was under siege by the Taipings, and uh, he almost got killed the day he arrived. A cannonball landed in the next building next to him. Um, so his missionary work got off to a bit of a rocky start. <laughs> um, but he was able, so he's preaching the gospel in, in, a, in a country that is literally at civil war because of a false prophet who claimed to be the son of God. So you can imagine the, the, the incredible obstacles that he's up against. Uh, but like Matteo Ricci, Hudson Taylor, he had great respect and, and love for the Chinese, and he understood the culture. He, he studied it relentlessly. He, he spoke three different Chinese dialects fluently. He dressed like a Chinese. He spoke like a Chinese. So he was able to communicate with the people in a way that they understood that was relevant to them. And he founded an, an organization called the China Inland Mission, which uh, was extremely successful. Uh, it, it was a Protestant missionary organization in China, very active in the 1800s. Uh, converted over 18,000 Chinese to Christianity uh, and, and founded hundreds of churches and 125 schools all over China. Uh, so H Hudson Taylor was the founder of this and he, he brought on many other missionaries working with him uh, to make this happen. <clears throat> but one of the, one of the obstacles, while this, is, while this is going on with the Protestant missions, there's also other history happening that ends up having a great effect on, on uh, the missionary work. And, one of those things is the Opium Wars from 1839 to 1860. At the same time that you have these, these missionaries from England and, and from Europe and from the United States coming over and preaching the gospel, you also have uh, Europeans coming over for less uh, beneficial purposes. <laughs> and one of the things that the British did was they controlled India, which was a British colony, so they would grow opium in India. And they were bringing it over, the, mer the British merchants would bring it over to China and sell, sell the opium in China, which was completely illegal. Uh, opium was illegal in England, uh, but <laughs> so they couldn't sell it back home, so they brought it to China. It was also illegal in China, but the, the, the thing was the Chinese didn't have the power to stop these merchants. They tried, and they tried two times. Each time sparked a major war between China and uh, Great Britain. And uh, each time the, the British completely decimated the Chinese because they had superior guns. They had superior technology. And uh, the British were ruthless. They, they, they attacked Beijing. They burned down the Summer Palace, which was one of China's great landmarks. Uh, and they, they took over Hong Kong and made it a British colony. So th this was a major uh, humiliation for the Chinese. Um, and the opium trade really devastated the Chinese economy <clears throat> because uh, people were getting addicted to opium. They couldn't work. It made them just lay around all the time. And uh, this was really affecting the Chinese economy, and, and when they tried to kick the British out, they, they were just, there was just a humiliating defeat for the Chinese. Uh, and, and Chinese to this day still remember the, the burning of the Summer Palace as uh, one of those great moments in Chinese history uh, that really caused a rise in anti-foreign, anti-British, and uh, as a result, anti-Christian sentiment in China, because Christi Christian missionaries were against the opium trade, but because a lot of them were British or foreigners, they were lumped in with this whole thing that was happening. Um, 
And this ultimately, ultimately led to an event called the Boxer Rebellion in the 1890s. Uh, the boxers were uh, basically a secret society. Uh, many of them are martial artists, and they call themselves the Society of Righteous and Harmonious Fists. Uh, that's literally what they call themselves. Uh, the short, short name for them was the boxers. <laughs> um, and their mission was to expel all foreigners from China. They hated the British because of the opium trade. They hated that they had burned the Summer Palace, that they had taken Hong Kong. They, they said that we can't allow China to be humiliated anymore by these foreigners. Let's just kick all of them out of China. And they also targeted Christians because they saw Christianity as a foreign religion, the religion of these foreigners who are taking advantage of us. Um, so what they did is they, they targeted and killed foreigners and, and Christians throughout China. And this led to, uh, uh, there was a hostage crisis in Beijing when the, the boxers took over uh, the international legations, which was a collection of embassies. Um, so th what happened was <clears throat> eight nations joined together to, to defeat the boxers. And th that included six European nations, the United States and Japan. They all formed an alliance to defeat the boxers uh, free the hostages and just take care of this whole situation in China where people were getting killed. Um, so these, this eight nation army moved in and they very easily defeated the boxers. The, the boxers were, were kind of a, a religious or superstitious uh, secret society and, and they believed that they had mystical practices that would make them bulletproof. Uh, but the reality was they were not bulletproof. And uh, when this eight nation army came in and, and just decimated the boxers. It, uh, and what happened is they, the, Beijing was occupied by these armies from eight different nations. The, the city was divided up. And the, the Chinese were very fearful in this, this time. They thought that their whole country was just going to be divided up by these eight different countries. And it was especially humiliating because even Japan, which was one of their Asian neighbors, was now joining in with the West in humiliating and occupying China. And this, this is a political cartoon that shows China being divided up by these eight different countries. And this is a, a painting of American soldiers capturing Beijing in uh, August 14, 1900. And that was one of the great battles of the Boxer Rebellion. Uh, so the Boxers were ultimately, ultimately defeated, but they did a lot of damage uh, to, to the Christian mission in China, uh, killing over 200 missionaries and 32,000 Chinese Christians were killed. Uh, they also destroyed many churches. And Hudson Taylor himself, uh, his mission lost 58 missionaries during this time, including 21 children. Uh, but Hudson Taylor uh, had an attitude of forgiveness toward the boxers. And uh, the Chinese government uh, offered to pay him money to make up for the loss of life and property, but he refused it. He said he refused it to demonstrate the meekness and gentleness of Christ. So that gives you an idea of the heart of Hudson Taylor, despite this, these incredible tragedies. Um, and then moving into the 20th century, there was a great civil war in China between the nationalists and the communists, uh, ultimately spanning from 1927 until 1949. Now, during this time, Chinese are fighting themselves over the future of the country, whether it's going to be nationalist, uh, a republic, or whether it's going to be communist. And it's a very long and drawn out civil war. Um, the imperial regime um, with the emperor has collapsed in 1911. Um, and it's very unclear how China is going to end up. And the Japanese invade at the worst possible time because Chinese are fighting each other, and then the Japanese invade, so the Chinese are fighting the Japanese while they're also fighting each other. So just incredible destruction. Um, ultimately, what happens is the two sides agree to join forces to defeat the Japanese, and then as soon as the Japanese are defeated in 1945, with the end of World War II, they start fighting each other again. Um, Mao Zedong was, of course, the communist leader who led a, a great military maneuver known as the Long March, which ultimately resulted in the communist takeover, takeover of China in 1949. Um, but this war, uh, this civil war in China, of course, this, this is not the first civil war. This is coming after the Taiping Rebellion. But this one, even more devastating, 32 million Chinese were killed in this time. Uh, and the war ends with the communist takeover of China. Uh, and I think the, the, the really important takeaway from this history is that, uh, from the Chinese perspective, this whole period from 1850, when the Opium Wars were going on, until about 1950, when um, the, the Civil War finally ends. This is known as the Century of Humiliation. Uh, it was a time when China was very weak. It was considered the, 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 the sick man of Asia. Uh, Japan was moving ahead and, and 
became uh, world power, but, but China was still uh, flayed with just one thing after another. You had the Opium Wars, and you had the, the Taiping Rebellion happened, and then you had the, the, the Boxer Rebellion, and you know, just when you think things are, are coming, you're going to be stabilized, this great civil war happens, and then the Japanese invade. So it's just one thing after another, incredible devastation in China, and incredible humiliation of the Chinese uh, by all these foreign powers, including the Japanese, coming in and, and humiliating the Chinese. So uh, when Mao Zedong uh, became the leader of China in 1949, one of the things that he wanted to do was modernize China and make it a powerful uh, modern country. And from his perspective, one of the things, the reason why China had been humiliated for 100 years was because it was stuck in these old uh, practices and old, old mindsets and old superstitious beliefs instead of moving forward and modernizing like Japan had done. So what he wanted to do was destroy what he called the four olds, old customs, old culture, old habits, and old ideas. And um, it, originally, he, he was more of a moderate communist. Uh, in fact, the Soviet Union didn't even consider him true communist. But as, he, as his rule went on, he became more and more radical. And the last 10 years of his life were the most radical and the worst time for Christians. And this is a 10-year period known as the Cultural Revolution. 1966 to 1976. And wh what the Cultural Revolution was, was a movement to change the entire culture of China. Uh, so he wanted to do away with anything related to the old, related to old ideas, which would include all religions, not just Christianity, but even Buddhism, even uh, Taoism, which is a Chinese religion. All of these religions suffered great persecution because Mao Zedong wanted to build an, a, a new culture based on uh, atheism, based on communism, based on science and reason. Uh, with no room for any thought about God or religion. Um, so there was great persecution during this time. Uh, the Bible was banned, many churches were destroyed, as well as temples and, and other religious buildings. Um, thousands of Christians were, were, were imprisoned, tortured, or executed. Uh, some were sent to re-education through labor camps where they, they were forced to do labor. Um, there was a lot of propaganda at the time to, to get people to give up their beliefs. And uh, at, least a, at least 100 million people were, were persecuted. Not just, I don't know how many of those were Christians, but uh, many people were persecuted if you had any kind of religious belief, if you uh, were uh, anti-communist in any way, if you opposed the regime in any way, there was, there was persecution. And at least, uh, at least a million people were killed. It's, uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of debate over how many people were killed in this period, but there, there, it was a very bad uh, period of persecution. Uh, and the amazing thing is this period was not that long ago. In, in fact, any of the older Chinese lived through this, through this time. One of my Chinese professors lived through this period. He was originally going to college, uh, and then the Cultural Revolution started, and they shut down the college, and they forced everyone to go out and work in the fields. So he was working in the fields for 10 years until he was able to go back to, to college. Um, and I, I met another Chinese woman who, during this time, she, she was very lucky in that she was interested in Christianity, and she happened to work in this office where they had access to a library that contained a Bible, which was very hard to come by in, in those days. Uh, so she would actually sneak in there at night uh, and with a notebook and literally copy the Bible word for word uh, secretly. And she did this for years until she had the entire Bible. And uh, if she was caught, she could have been imprisoned or uh, you know, she, she, she could have been tried for this. Um, so th this, this is a time that the uh, people rem remember it wasn't that long ago. Um, and some people experienced great persecution. Some people got through it without a lot of persecution. It really varied depending on what region of China and, and, and different aspects of it. Um, but a, in 1976, <clears throat> Mao Zedong dies. And as soon as he dies, the Chinese government initiates major changes. It completely condemns the Cultural Revolution as being a, a, a total failure. Uh, it calls it the decade of disaster or the decade of destruction. And uh, many of those responsible are, are put on trial and, uh, and um, found guilty. And <clears throat> over time, the, the Chinese government initiates major changes. Under, under Deng Xiaoping, there's more capitalist economic reform, uh, where communism is, although the Communist Party remains in power, uh, the goal of communism is basically done away with. And uh, th there's more and more freedom emerging in China. And today, the Chinese have uh, religious freedom, but there's also some restrictions on it. Um, according to the Chinese Constitution, there's the freedom to 
believe whatever you want to believe. There's religious freedom. But some of the restrictions are there's, uh, you're not allowed to preach openly in public. So you, you can practice, but you can't preach. Uh, and those who do preach openly in public, whether it be street evangelism, witnessing, uh, may, be, uh, may, may be persecuted for that by the, by the government. And um, another restriction is that you're supposed to go to a government-approved church. Uh, and many Christians do go to these churches, but, but many also do not. Uh, and, and choose instead to meet in home fellowships, which is not legal. Uh, but the government is a, knows that there's, there's a very growing movement of, of, home, of home fellowships and house churches in China. They're, uh, they're operating outside of government control. And sometimes these leaders are imprisoned uh, and their churches are shut down. Um, especially if they speak out against the government. So there's this uh, tolerance of religion to an extent, uh, but if, if you speak out against the government in, in any way, there's, there, there's a crackdown. Uh, but despite this, this persecution, Christianity is growing rapidly in China. There's an estimated 100 million Christians in China today. Um, and the legacy of the Taiping Rebellion, of which we covered earlier, is one of the reasons why the Chinese government is still suspicious of Christianity. Um, because although uh, Hong Xiuquan was not a true Christian, he was a false prophet, there's still this um, very unfortunate relationship between that and Christianity. Um, three things that we can pray for as Christians. Uh, we can pray for Japan because uh, there's, uh, Christianity is it's such a minority religion in Japan, but we can pray that God will send workers into the harvest uh, who will be like Francis Xavier and who will preach the gospel effectively. Uh, we can pray for China that Christians will be able to, to witness and, and preach their faith without persecution. Uh, and we can also pray for North Korea, which I didn't have time to go into, but there's, there's a long history there. And, and North Korea is where Christians endure the worst persecution of anywhere in the world. Um, absolutely unbelievable persecution happening that makes China look like the land of the free in comparison. Um, so we, we really need to pray for our, our Christian brothers and sisters in North Korea. Uh, here's a list of some important dates that you can add to your timeline. Um, I'd like to thank you for uh, coming and, and have a great night.